God the Holy Spirit, the grace moving, quickens and opens a spiritual deadness. A light ray of truth and glory and beauty shine in where it had never gone before. It touches a deep part of you that you have never had awakened in your life. You experience something you've never known, namely spiritual perception of divine glory. And you know this is real and nobody will ever take it from you. So how does Jesus overcome our spiritual darkness? That's the question John Piper answers from John 1, 14 to 18 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on November 9th, 2008. There are two obstacles to be overcome in this text. One obstacle is my blindness apart from grace. I can't see because I'm blind. And the other obstacle is that the world is filled with darkness and there was no compelling light in it. Now, those are two things. In order to see, you, you have to have eyes that are workable and you have to have something to see. So there are two kinds of darkness. The darkness that fills the world and the darkness that fills my mind. I'm blind and this world is under the darkening influence of the devil. Those two obstacles have to change. That's got to change. And this text is about, and this gospel is about how God is changing them. Darkness in our souls is overcome by regeneration or new birth. Darkness in the world is overcome by incarnation. The Word became flesh. There's my summary statement. Darkness in here, my blindness, my deadness, my darkness, is overcome by being born again, regeneration. Darkness out there is overcome by light has come into the world. The Word was made flesh. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. And that's incarnation. So regeneration and incarnation are the answers to these two problems. My blindness and the world's darkness. The key to both is the glory of God in Christ overflowing with grace. We have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father full and spilling over with grace and truth. So the glory that comes into the world in Christ starts banishing the light, I mean the darkness, starts banishing the darkness. And out of that glory comes grace, and grace moves into me and causes me to be born again so that my eyes can see the glory out there, so that grace is the goal and the means of the new birth. Do you hear that? It's the goal because it's the radiance and the fullness and the beauty which is the glory and to be born again is to see it, love it, be satisfied by it and someday have it fully. That's the goal of the new birth is to see the glory. But what's coming out of the glory? Grace is coming out of the glory. And what does grace do? It causes me to be born again. And what does that do? It opens my eyes to see it. Everything's coming from Jesus. Everything's going to Jesus. The glory is the source of my life. The glory is the goal of my life. The glory of Jesus is the source of my seeing. And the glory of Jesus is the object of my seeing. He's everything. Now, how does John, in verses 15 to 18, develop this? The first thing he does before he supports verse 14 with verse 16, the first thing he does is let John the witness... John the Baptist, have a word. It's like a little parenthesis here. 
John's the witness. He wants to let him say something in this regard. And so here's what he says, verse 15. John bore witness about him. And he cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now, the, the point of that verse is the ranking of Jesus. The firstness of Jesus in the sense of not just time, but rank, dignity, greatness. Temporally, John came first in ministry. And then Jesus showed up and John pointed to him and John decreased and Jesus increased. But John said, that's really not the way it is. I'm pointing to him and I'm saying, go to him, make much of him. He's the great, he's the first because he really was before me. And I think the author here wants us to hear verse one in that. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I, I think when he writes verse 15 and lets John say, the reason he ranks so high, and I'm going down and he's going up, is because he didn't just come along after me, and then I say, okay, there's, there's a man you can follow. No, 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 no. Before Abraham was, I am. And John is saying his origins are from ancient days. He knows his Old Testament. He knows his Micah. Now verse 16. Begins with the word because, believe it or not. Shame on the ESV for translating it and. Should be because or for. Because it's exactly the same word that starts verse 17, which starts for. And so to reflect seriously on this, you say, how does verse 16 support or argue for verse 14? Because I'm treating verse 15 as a parenthesis. We have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father. I'm reading verse 14. Full of grace and truth because, I'm down at verse 16 now, because from his fullness we all receive grace upon grace. Why could we see his glory? Because we received grace upon grace. Grace enables you to see. That's the argument. So John is saying, receiving grace is the reason we could see glory. This is explicit. I'm not making this up. We have seen his glory because we have all received grace. So the we and the we seeing and receiving grace. Grace. This is a supernatural work. Seeing the glory of Christ is a supernatural event. You know it is because there are millions of people who read this and they don't see any glory at all. Right? They read this, they yawn and turn the television back on. There is no glory to be seen in it as far as most people are concerned because they have not been born again by that grace. This is a supernatural thing, this Christianity. It's a weighty, weighty thing. You hear the story. That's what evangelism is. God, the Holy Spirit, the grace moving, quickens and opens a spiritual deadness. A light ray of truth and glory and beauty shine in where it had never gone before. It touches a deep part of you that you have never had awakened in your life. You experience something you've never known, namely spiritual perception of divine glory. And you know this is real. And nobody will ever take it from you again. You become not just an advocate for a system, but a witness to a reality. Kind of scary, isn't it? Because we're just playing games if it's not happening. We're just playing games. Trying to turn it into some kind of intellectual system. 
We can learn in Sunday school and then spout out with our mouths and do some religious exercises. Before you're done, you'll, you'll get tired of that. It's either real, God is real, the Holy Spirit is real, you've experienced a conversion and you've seen glory by virtue of God's work in your life, and that glory has taken captive of you because Jesus is the most beautiful person you've ever known and you could never walk away from him because he's totally compelling to your heart or you're not saved. That's the way you get saved. Verse 17 begins with four. Or because, same word that begins verse 16. Because... Let's read 16 and 17 together so you hear it. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Huh. Where's he going? Why does he bring Moses up? Why does he bring the law up? What in the world? This is hard for me. I had to think for hours about this. Read, think, doodle, draw, think again. What is, why is Moses brought up here? Why is the law brought up here? What's, what's the point of Moses? Now, here's the danger. We know our Paul pretty well here, right? We know our Romans and our Galatians. We love the doctrine of justification by faith alone, apart from works of the law. And we sense the antithesis between the law and grace. And we can quote verses. I got a list of them here in my notes that make grace and law feel like, mm, like that. And so if you bring all that to this, you're probably going to miss the point. Be careful. Let the context work this for you. Why is Moses brought up here? I'm going to tell you why I think he's brought up. What's going on in this text? Well, what's going on in this text is seeing glory. It's just totally dominant. We beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That kind of language is just really Old Testament. And it's really Old Testament in particular places and with regard to particular persons like Moses. If you were to ask any schooled Jewish person in that century, who's the biggest hero that wrestled his way through to seeing the glory of God? Everybody would say Moses. In spite of Isaiah 6, everybody would say Moses. And I'll read you why they would say that. The first giving of the law, Moses shattered the Ten Commandments because of the golden calf. And after that event and the punishment, God is pulling back. And Moses is desperate for God. In chapter 33 of Exodus, I'll just read them to you. Don't, you don't need to try to go there. First, the general statement, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. Whoa, that's intimate. He speaks to him in the tent of meeting out there, comes out, goes back. Joshua stays, loves the fellowship, had a different spirit than all those other ragtag ten spies who later wouldn't go in 40 years later. Now, he says to God in verse 13, Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. So he's pleading, show me your ways. We can't go anywhere. We can't go up. We can't move. If you don't show me your ways and I can see you active and personal in my life, I'm not going anywhere. I can't lead this people. He's wrestling with a sight of God's ways. Verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you, for you have found favor in my sight. I know you by name. 
And then Moses, since he's on a roll here, pushes it to the limit and says, Moses said, please show me your glory. And God responded with grace. This glory that he's about to show is full of grace. Listen, this is verses 19 following. God said, I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory, my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by, and then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back, but my face you will not see. End of chapter 33, and the next thing that happens is the second giving of the Ten Commandments, and it goes like this. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the first, the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Okay, that is why I think John brought up Moses. Moses represents in the Old Testament, among all the heroes who had intimate relations with God, the one who most explicitly battled his way through, I want to see your glory. And God answers, you can see the back of my glory, and then when I describe my glory to you, I'm going to describe it to you in terms of grace. And when John reads that, he says, okay, I, I need to say something about that. That's what's going on in verse 17. I need to relate that to the, the glory that shows up in Jesus. Okay. So verse 16 refers to receiving grace upon grace. That's then grounded in the fact that in verse 17, through Moses was given law and through Christ happened, arrived, grace and truth. And I think grace upon grace then probably means we've got the grace of Exodus 33, we've got the grace of Jesus, and grace is just pouring wave upon wave now from Moses through Jesus into the world. And we should be very thankful. I think it's a contrast between Jesus and Moses. Verse 18 confirms me in that, that Jesus is so much greater than Moses. He's qualitatively different than Moses. Moses was giving the law. Then another grace comes through Jesus. And the contrast is Moses points to grace, points to grace. Jesus performs grace. There's a huge difference there, isn't there? pointing to grace and performing grace. Moses reports the words of God. Jesus is the word of God. The law mirrors the light of God. Jesus is the light of God. This is a contrast and a great infinite increase in greatness and rank. Now verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he made him known. That's John's way of saying, even Moses was not allowed to see him front to front. Put your hand over the wall, let go by, you see my back. 
And now, Jesus comes, and he's not at God's back. He's in God's lap. Right? Isn't that what it says? The old King James, in the bosom of the Father, literally in the chest of the Father, like he's being hugged all the time, or like he's sitting on his knee. Not a very good image for the majesty of the word, but you get the idea. Moses could, could catch the backside of the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God because he's coming straight from a face-to-face unity with the Father. This is the very glory of God. He and the Father are one. So Moses may have given his best gift that he could give, namely the law. But 118 says that there's something vastly superior, namely the very presence of God among us. He is making him known. He is narrating him. Be a literal translation. Jesus is narrating God. Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness. Jesus is lifted up on the cross. Moses said, manna will come down. Jesus is the manna that comes down. Moses, John 5, 45, wrote about the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The law of Moses was the Word of God. Christ was God the Word. So this is what John is trying to do for us. He's taking all the admiration of Moses, all the admiration of the law, all the admiration of that that divine encounter in Exodus 33 and says, basically, this grace, this arrival, this light, this glory, this narration of God is infinitely more significant than that one. No one has ever seen God fully. Not even Moses. But now, the one who is at the Father's side, front, chest, he is making him known. The simplest believer in the world, and this can happen to a child. They won't be able to describe it very well. But it can happen to a child. The simplest believer in the world who sees Jesus Christ for who he is, sees the glory of God full of grace and truth and are drawn to him forever. Jesus said, John fourteen nine, whoever has seen me has seen what? The Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Let me end with one other verse where he says that. This is John twelve forty four. Jesus cried and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. He who believes in me doesn't believe in me. He believes in my Father. And who sees me doesn't just see me. He sees my Father. To see Jesus is to see him as the only Son of the Father, full of divine glory, overflowing with grace, and be drawn to him and become a child of God. This is Light and Truth. God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper preaches on the Lamb who takes away sin from John 1, 19 to 34 in our series on the Gospel of John, God's Final Message. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.